Now, I should mention as well, you had uh, you had a rather poignant day you were in the park. Right. It was the Sunday after 9-11. That day, thanks for asking about that. That actually, um, if I ever play Carnegie Hall, which is just down there, <laughs> um, if I ever play Carnegie Hall, if I ever play Giant Stadium, if I ever play Madison Square Garden, it will never match that day. Um, uh, we had, uh, we had, um, that day, which was, I, I don't think, a little editorializing here, I, I am almost, like a lot of New Yorkers, um, almost offended every year when we see the signs and the memes that say, never forget. Yeah. How the fuck would you ever forget? Yeah. I mean, uh, we, I was actually, the Sixth Avenue, on Sixth Avenue, um, trying to, rescue a friend who was in a building and scared. And uh, so me and this other guy were going against a sea of human beings. We were heading downtown and, and watched the unthinkable happening. It was, anyway, that week was a very surreal week. Um, Bridge from tunnels closed, no air, air traffic. Yeah, it was yep. people that needed to get back to the UK couldn't. People, yep. um, no air traffic overhead. It was weird. Um, when the wind would change, we could smell the burning up here. It was, um, and, there, and nobody knew. There was no, it, that day, I didn't, see, now of course, not being there at the World Trade Center, but but in town that day, I did not see terror. I saw nothing but focus. Yeah. I saw people with a look on their faces like, okay, what do we do now? What's happening? What do we do now? I saw people helping each other. I saw people lining up at blood banks, which wasn't needed, but I saw, um, it was just a very weird week. So that Sunday, I, I had been playing in the park um, for, that was 2000, so I'd been playing in the park for eight years by that point. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'll probably, probably be alone, but let me just go and do what I do. Um, so I showed up at the hill and I set the stuff up and there were about 10, 15 people waiting for me, which kind of surprised me in a way. Um, and just started to play what I play. I was not, I'm not a flag waver because I'm not one of these I'm proud to be an American guys. That's bullshit, you know, it's like, anyway, so I, no, nothing like that, no memorials and nothing said. I was just gonna do what I do. And that day, um, in about an hour, there might have been 1,500 people there. There, might have, there was over 1,000 people. It was, they were, well, you've seen the, yeah, the hill. They were spot, that is 10 deep, hill, it? 10 deep at the, going out into the road. They were sitting next to me. It was, it was, I, I never seen anything like it. It was like everybody who had ever been there felt like that's where they wanted to be that day. It was five days after 9-11. So suddenly there's this ocean of people and I'm, playing the fun stuff and the pretty stuff and the silly stuff and um but at one point I stopped and I looked at all of these faces again it's weird because I'm Joe and Irene's baby boy I'm a son of a New York City firefighter what the fuck am I doing in front of all these people I still feel that way you got kind of imposter syndrome I guess. Yeah, exactly yeah. exactly but I'm sitting there and there's a thousand people or, or more and um, and I looked at them and I said, you know, if you're anything like me, and you probably are because you're here, this week has been very strange. So you might find yourself walking up the street and you stop at the corner and you think to yourself, you're just filled with rage, like uncontrollable rage. And then the light turns green and you walk to the next corner and you start weeping like a baby. And then the light turns green and you walk to the next corner and you're suddenly filled with rage again. And the light turns green and you walk to the next corner and you think to yourself, 
Huh, maybe pizza for lunch. That might be the toughest corner because we don't know how to feel and we don't know where to put this. We don't know what to do. Let yourself off the hook. We've never done this before. If you don't know how to feel, that's exactly how you should be feeling. Yeah. And I looked at these faces. It was like, it was like a thousand people went, ah. and I played a song called City Song that I'd written. And um, I'd written the year before about New York City. And uh, again, and everybody, st together. everybody stood up and we just stood there applauding and clapping and crying for ourselves. Oh, wow. For five minutes. It was, it was, and then just went on with the next silly song. Or I had somebody get up and sing with me or it, it was, but I've never felt anything. It seemed to me like that was one of those moments where I don't know where the words came from, but they came from my heart and they needed to hear them. And that's really pretty much what writing a song is anyway, you know? Um, but it's incredible you'd written that song a year before and that all came together on the day. I mean, that. Yeah, that was, that was. There's only one word that's changed since then. This song used to go, there's nothing like the sparkle of her skyline after dark. And now the song is, there's still nothing like the sparkle of her skyline after dark. Um, but, um, and I believe you had quite a bit of uh, contribution from the public, which you then donated to your dad's well, former yeah, fire that, uh, station. Yeah, that, well, that was, that was crazy too, because um, that week, Tom Hanks, you know, who was probably a beautiful man, um, um, was, you know, raising money with the 9-11 fund and Bon Jovi was doing a, yeah. And, uh, and I said, you know what, guys? Um, it wasn't my dad's unit, but there was uh, um, right on 77th Street. Yeah. The guys at Ladder 77 would sometimes drive the truck on a weekend and actually hang out between runs and hang out with while we're playing. They lost 11 guys that day, um, just in that house. And uh, so I said, you know what? And I don't know those guys. I just said, but you know what? Anything that winds up in the guitar case today, no 9-11 fund, no Tom Hanks. Yeah. We're just going to walk it down there and give it to their families. So I'm playing. Uh, I was living alone at that time. So I get home that night, and I'm overwhelmed. I mean, the whole day was just emotional and... And again, magical. I can't explain it. But I'm used to laying money out and unfolding dirty dollar bills and, you know, and stacking them and stuff, right? So I'm doing this. And I'm doing the 20s and the 10s and the 5s. And I'm stacking them. And I'm going, okay. One, two, three, five, six. Okay, 700, 800. Okay, 1,000. Okay. One, two, and I'm counting and I keep going, I'm doing this wrong. What's wrong with me? Because my mathematical brain doesn't work. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing this wrong. And then I realized I was doing it right. And there was $7,250 in that guitar case. Wow. I was, I was overwhelmed. Um, so <laughs> the following day or the day after, I walked it down to that firehouse and they, they knew me because there's only one of me and there's a bunch of them. Yeah. But, um, and they were thanking me and I said, oh no, 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 I'm not giving you this money. The people are. But you collected it and that's a wonderful thing to do. A it, what a wonderful thing to do. Well, it was the next thing to do, you know. Um, and I guess also, um, so during the pandemic, you couldn't do your concert. So you, again, took a kind of bad period in our lives. That was wild. Yeah, that was wild. Because I actually had a head start. Um, let me think. No. We can start meandering back up toward the hill. Let's yeah. go. Uh, okay. Oh, this is literary walk. So let's go here. We can walk back up. I'll show you the very first place I ever played. Brilliant. Um, yeah, that was um, when the pandemic hit. But I had a head start. There's a, a folk singer, a woman named um, Christine Lavin. And I don't know, again, I don't know that much. Uh, we can cross, I think. 
Um, I don't know that much about the music business, especially the folk world, but, um, oops, but, um, um, she's kind of big in the folk world and, uh, she had turned me on to something called, now I can't remember, uh, oh, by the way, look at this, I got a group here. This is, well, I'll show you right here. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> right next to, now, why he's still here, I don't know. Um, but I was right, I was right here. These benches weren't here then. There was a fence. And I was right here that first day and people were gathering and I just started crying like a baby. <laughs> Packed everything up and went home. This is the first place I ever played. Wow. Um, anyway. Cool, isn't it? That's, that's always yeah. never a special place, isn't it? So. I guess so. I haven't been here in a while. Um, Why is that covered in barriers? Just like, um, I don't know. Maybe people are defacing it because it's Christopher Columbus. Ah. I'm guessing. I don't know. He's, he's not in vogue anymore, then. <laughs> oh, he, I think historically, I've always known he was a villain, but <laughs> um, <laughs> discovered a place that people already lived. <laughs> yes. It's not that tough. <laughs> no, yes. Uh, we, we have a few of our own in the UK. Right? <laughs> yes. No, but yeah, so this is called Literary Walk, and Oh, is Robert Burns' statue down here? Yeah, probably. I've got a friend who said to look out for that. Actually. Okay, so. I'll, I'll bet you. I'll bet you. We'll see. We'll see, Bob. So, yeah, so, uh, what, so not... Oh, anyway, yeah, so what were you talking about? So uh, the... On, online. The, oh, online. Discovered a platform. Yeah, what was it called? It was it, called... It, it wasn't Zoom. Was it Concert Zoom? Window, I think. Oh, okay, right. Um, yes, con Concert Window. Um, and, and introduced me to a guy... Was it Jeff or whatever who founded it? And so I started fooling around with it um, uh, a few years before the pandemic. Because it's a very weird thing. Um, like I'm sure you're learning on a daily basis about podcasting and cameras and, yeah, absolutely. you know, and what, platforms what works and what yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Um, this, I remember I had a George Wurzbach, who is the piano player who plays with me at, um, at my concerts, like at Merkin Concert Hall. He's, again, probably a finer songwriter than I will ever be. The most versatile, brilliant piano player. Brilliantly funny mind. Writes beautiful, poignant, profound songs. Um, I had him come over one time in the early days to be a guest on whatever I was calling it then, the weekly show or something, on Concert Window. And he said, holy, he finished a song and he was like, Holy shit, this is weird. Because there's no uh, feedback. You're playing the... to a glass, a little piece of glass, yeah. and there's, you know, 50 people on the other side of it, but it's just weird. And it takes some getting used to. So I had a head start. Then the pandemic hit, and I thought, all right, let's, let's give people a place to go. So I started this thing called It's Just Us because that was the first thing I said that very first day and I've been saying it ever since. It's just us and uh, and it kind of caught on, not in a big way, but it kind of created a, a community of people. We've got, I did one yesterday. Yes, you invited me to one yeah. last night, didn't you? And so yesterday, uh, there were very few New Yorkers uh, in the crowd. It was Switzerland, the Netherlands, um, Maine, Florida, West Virginia, California, uh, people from all over the place. So the world is your Central Park. Now. It kind of is yeah. in a way. But, Tim, truthfully, it's time for me to get off. I mean, it's, um, it's time for me to get off the stage. Uh, because, like I also said, um, like and so I keep singing. Got to keep it moving. Although she's awful. <laughs> Don't want to encourage her, but <laughs> but you got to keep the money moving. Yeah. That's one of the things I always see too. Benjamin Franklin was a brilliant human being, but I disagree with him about one thing. He said, "A penny saved is a penny earned," 
And I say a penny saved is essentially worthless unless it's moving. Yes. A penny saved is a piece of copper. Money is dirty paper. I have been proving that for 32 years. Money is dirty paper. It's what it represents. Unless it keeps moving, it's... And again, I'm the luckiest man alive, so I, this is kind of a religious thing for me. <laughs> Keep playing, brother. Um, I suppose now as well, though, you, I mean, I, I've come to the US four times in a row now where I haven't actually taken any money out. I've just used my oh right, 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 Apple right. Pay or my credit card. Is that how, how for buskers now? Is that that must be a problem? It's right? it is it's 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 um. Well, see, I, I'm again. This is personified cuteness. I don't even know what's going on over here. Um, the um. The um. The timing of my life again, I think, is perfect and not. Not by design, but by imagination. I've been saying for about the last four or five years, it's time for me to get off the stage. Yeah. And just saying that out loud to the universe or whatever the fuck, uh, circumstances that other people would think, oh man, that really sucks. I'm like, nah, it's kind of perfect. Tourism hasn't come back to Central Park. We are living in a cashless society. Yep. Um, so I have one of the reasons I always thought I was so successful, maybe the most successful busker in the history of this town. I, I can't imagine anybody else ever having seven thousand dollars in their guitar case. Yeah. But um, let's see, if we get around this. Oh, we can to go around this way. Unless you want to go down to the fountain. Yes, yeah, so let's have a look at All that. Right. That's good. Um, I'm getting a very good tour. Of right. Park yeah. From the from the best knowledge in the business. <laughs> this is cool. This is good. Um, but it's like, uh, one of the reasons I've always felt I might be so successful is that there are at least 10 motives for everything we do. Um, and sometimes the difference between motives is the width of a sheet of paper. You know, it's like, so I come to the park to make a living. Of course I do, to make yeah. money. But it's gotta be about sharing the music. It's gotta be, it's gotta be. Thanks, so I always say sharing music, making a living. Okay, the sharing music has to stay on top. It has to be number one. So I have never in 32 years, we were the same way on Bleecker Street, even during the sex, drugs, and rock and roll years, um, I would never put out a tip jar. Yeah. We'd say to the owner, you're paying us and no cover charge for the people. It's, we're here to, you pay for the music for them to hear. Um, Anyway, this is Bethesda Fountain, which has been in every movie ever since the beginning of time. Um, Beautiful. Not running at the moment, though. No. Um, it's it, it really is nice. It's uh, it's magic. It's and we can cruise up that way. Let's see. Anyway, so so um, I've never put out a sign that says tips. I never put out a sign that says you know. My sister needs an operation. I mean, you know, nothing ever about money. Um, but in this day and age, keep playing, man. Um, um, nobody's walking around with money. So I put a sign out that says Venmo. And I've got a little sign that has a QR code for, uh, for PayPal. Yeah. It just doesn't feel good to have a sign out that has anything to do with money, but some days there's a percentage, a good percentage that's in there. So, um, but the t again, the timing is perfect because I have gotten more joy out of writing the song and creating the song and recording the song and being in the studio with musicians, you know, like, creating something 
than I ever did on stage. I love being on stage. It's just because I'm not impressed by it. It's like I said, the gift of mediocrity. It's just like, okay, I'm here. I got the guitar. You guys are there. Are you all here because of something I said? I guess so. So we just have a good time. So but, is, that, is, that, is that leading to why you're, you turned to playwright? Well, yeah, I, I think I've always been a playwright. And I don't know that much about the theater business. But I've been really lucky that um, there's, an, there's a director named Leonard Folia. Uh, his first Broadway show was Masterclass. Um, he's brilliant, he's nice, he's the kind of artist I aspire to work with. He fell in love with one of my scripts decades ago and has been wanting to bring it to Broadway ever since. So I've been kind of knowing, all right, I, I got this, I know how to do this. Um, so I've gotten to the place where one of my plays was produced in Louisville, Kentucky and they flew me down to watch opening night. And, and that's a thrill that I can't, I can't describe. Yeah, is, is something you've written on the page. It's to sit in the dark. Yeah. Um, stop screaming. Um, punch him in the face. Punch him in the face. Anyway, I think this is the famous Bow Bridge. This is about a million, about a million wedding proposals here, right? Do I have any more left? Let's see. <gasps> One more. That's right. Keep playing, man. Um, very good navigating with this around the park. Yeah, that's actually you're kind of clearing the way with it. <laughs> so, is there any more uh, chances? Like? Excuse me, let me take a picture. Oh. Flip it around. Oh, excuse me. Let okay. Me. <laughs> good. Flip. Okay, let's get the sun behind you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, Perfect. Oh, That's okay. okay. You're welcome. Have a nice day. You too. You're a very kind soul. Yeah, now stop that religion crap. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's part of my work is to, is to, well, part, and it goes back to the playwriting. Um, my most recent play is, well, I've got two things going on. I get a, a uh, a screenplay that's a movie musical, yeah. believe it or not, called That Christmas Eve, but it's a When Harry Met Sally kind of thing. Yeah. It's a romantic comedy. Um, but my most recent play for Broadway is called The Green Room, and it's the funniest, most entertaining way, and powerful by the end, I think, um, of, of jump-starting a conversation for the human race. And I know that sounds pretentious, but I really want to jump-start a conversation for the human race where I can have a seat at the table and say to every Muslim, every Christian, every Jew, every, you don't need this anymore. You don't need it. Um, I get how it was all created at a time when human beings needed to make sense of the unknowable. But all religion, all of it, all it brings to the human race, other than something that is inherently what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, what is inherently good about human beings, the only thing that religion brings is division. If anybody can tell me one other positive thing it brings, let's have the conversation. There's nothing. Well, it gives me a sense of community. I've got a sense of community, and I play guitar in Central Park. Um, atheists have a sense of community. It's like we human beings don't need the invisible friends anymore. Um, and that's part of my work. As we speak, uh, you know, in, in Israel and Gaza, we're, we're in the middle of Thank you. the very thing you're saying. And, and you will talk to both sides and say, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't religious. And, well, wait a minute. I don't think that's the star of Walter on your flag. <laughs> you know, it's like, of course, the root original sin, if you will, is religion. It's your invisible friends telling you that you're right and they're wrong. 
that this is your land and it's not theirs. That you have the right to kill them. It's, of course it is. But anyway, that's part of my, it's part of my work. And but, so how, and that, is, that, is that on stage now or going? Well, I'm trying so hard. It's, it seems like it's, it, these both plays, Jack Flew and The Green Room, have come so close to seeing a Broadway stage. Um, and then things fall through and this because it's so much money these yeah. days to, you know. And people who, who call themselves producers, when I think of producers, I think of like the old movies we grew up on, you know, where the producer has an idea and then hires the right people and, you know, we're gonna put on a show. And, and um, yeah, let's say that way, I don't know yeah. why. I haven't been up this way in a long time. Um, um, but the term producer these days really only means investor. These people have no idea how to put on a show. Yeah. They write a check. That's why during the Tony Awards you'll see 30 of them get up, you know. Um, it's just the money now. It's, yeah. it's yeah. money. And the producer is really a, a general manager. These are the people who know the nuts and bolts of theater. And they're two different skill sets. General managers know how to put up the show, but they're inherently terrible at raising money. And producers have no fucking idea. They don't have a creative bone in their body, but they're really good at raising money. Yeah. So it's been a balance. It's been a tug of war between the two things uh, for me. Um, my feeling is, again, the timing is probably perfect. Because when things fall through, it gives me what I call the freedom from hope. I'd be hoping, 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 then it falls through. All right, what's the next idea? It's like, um, and I have a feeling that the screenplay is gonna sell, and these shows, let's get it this way, this, these two shows are gonna somehow wind up on Broadway and off Broadway simultaneously, and I have no empirical evidence to say that that's true. It just feels like that's what's going to happen. Wouldn't it be good? You've captured this on video, and then it, whenever it happens, it, you, oh, exactly. I, I, You're going to say, "See, see I said that." <laughs> and that's why I just wrote a song called um, "Made in My Dreams," is um, is just exactly about that. Is that um, people say this song goes? Uh, some people say, the way I live is backwards. They don't know how a full-grown man can live this way. But if people say, the way I live is backwards, then I'm aware that I don't care what people say. Some scratch their heads at my determination to live each day the way I truly feel, paying close attention to my own imagination while imagining the best becoming real. Well, here I am, and that's the the point of it is, I'm making this up as I go along, but my whole life was made in my imagination, in my dreams. Talking to you right now. Yeah. What the hell is this? Why would anybody want to talk to me about this stuff? Well, it's fascinating. That's right. <laughs> There's a whole audience out there who will be interested in this it's as like, well. Let's head this. I'm just trying to wind this back to the hill yeah. somehow. <laughs> Which, by the way, this is a kick. Um, <laughs> the hill. You've seen it. It's a yeah. it's a knoll. It's a bump. It's yeah. a. Um, let's see. Do I know how to get out of here? Maybe I don't. That's the <laughs> San Remo. So if we just keep heading over that way. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's the road. Okay. Um, at least it's not covered in snow. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what the hell was I just talking about? I don't remember. Uh, well, you know, you come into screen and, you know, you've, you've predicted it now and how it's going to... Yeah, it's just out. that uh, everything I've imagined, I used to imagine when I was, all my life, making a living as an artist. Doing whatever I wanted to do and been able to make a living. That's happened. Yeah. I, well, how? Well, this happened, that happened, Jack Rosenthal was there, this, the article was in the New York Times, this happened. Um, I met that person, I ran into that. Um, I took the chance and did this when logic said don't, 
which I think is a big part of it. I'll tell people too, you know, it's like, you've heard life described as a roller coaster, and yeah, it is. But the roller coaster at a little county fair is a 10 ticket ride, while the merry-go-round is only five tickets. The roller coaster is a 10 ticket ride, and it's not because of the, ah, oh, ah. You know why it's a 10 ticket ride? It's this. Tick, 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 tick. Right there. That's why it's a 10 ticket ride. That moment. And and I live in that moment most of the time. It's. But if then the next thing is something that is scary or flies in the face of logic, do it anyway. Now, you mentioned earlier about the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, and again, when I was in my research, this may or may not be right, because you can never be sure with Wikipedia, but I believe <laughs> you did a song. Oh, Wikipedia, by with, the way. Is... With, with Sid Bernstein, who brought the Beatles to the States originally. Yes. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Sid Bernstein is, um, well, he died in 2013. Yeah. Um, there was... Uh, I can even show you the bench. He, I was playing for five, seven years by that time, and a guy said to me, "Do you see this guy on the bench?" And I, he was hard to miss. He was rotund. He had this big head of silver hair, um, and he was there every week, just smiling and listening to the music. And so he said, "You see this guy?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "That's Sid Bernstein." And I said. Who is that, your dentist? Like, what do you mean? I don't know, Sid Bernstein? No, the guy on the Beatles posters. I said, oh, no kidding. So I went over and I just wanted to thank him because of that moment in second grade. Um, it was his idea to bring the Beatles to America. Yeah. Um, and how legendary that was. Yeah, and it was his idea to, yeah. we need more seats. Let's fill Shea Stadium. Uh, he just, you know, he was not a, he was a terrible businessman, but he was like me. He was a, a dreamer. He was a possibility junkie. He just said, all right, let's do it. Um, he made fortunes. He lost fortunes. When I first met Sid, he was broke. Um, but I walked over to thank him and he said, we should have lunch. And we did. And we became such good friends. Um, um, I would, I first, early on, told him people that he's like the grandfather I never had, and he would say, Big Brother. And I'd say, All right. So he would call me Little Brother, I'd call him Big Brother. Um, and people had our relationship backwards. Like, they would think, Well, can't Sid do anything for you? It was backwards by that point. Sid, um, seriously, was, was pretty much broke at that point. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anybody that he launched careers for, like McCartney and Jagger, and I don't think any of them were aware of it. I think yeah. they all assumed Sid was great, because they all would have helped him. I'm yeah. sure they would have. Um, but so, so our relationship was pretty much, he was a food junkie, so we, it was all about lunch and dinner and desserts. And, um, but I would put, I would put Sid Bernstein presents on things. He wasn't presenting shit, <laughs> but I would just put it on there. Good vehicle for you. Cause, no, but also because he felt he was in the game. Yeah. And um, and so we were just really, really good friends. Um, and right, up, he's an inspiration because uh, he died at 95. He was still talking about David. In my next book, you're going to be this and that's that. David, I'm going to do another concert in Liverpool to help cancer research. And I want you to say, he was 95 years old um, and still dreaming. He was, he, and so anyway, so one day he, um, and he was, I say this all the time, he was the friend that you have who would call and leave a five or 10 minute voicemail because he would forget he was talking to a machine. Yeah. So I, I got used to that. It was, and then the funny thing was, at the end of every message, he would go on for five minutes, and then he would go, "So call me later." It said, <laughs> like, like I didn't know. So, so 
one day I see a message and it's from Sid and I click on it and I still saved it. Um, it says, uh, David, it's, it's Sid, it's Monday, want to do the loop, <laughs> the complete loop? Um, he said, it's Sid, it's Monday morning, 9 a.m. Keep hope alive, okay? Keep hope alive. And then he hung up. I was like, so I had the idea, I'm going to write a song called Keep Hope Alive. Here's a man who affected music history, world history, in ways that are indescribable and very real, but he's never played a note of music and he's never written a song. Yeah. So I'm gonna write a song called Keep Hope Alive and I'm gonna say Words and Music by Sid Bernstein and David Abolito. Oh, that's so, weird. Right? So I start trying to write this song and it's, um, impossible to write a song called Keep Hope Alive and not write a Hallmark card. It's like, I'm writing crap. <laughs> um, and then I almost gave up on it, about three weeks. I'm like, then the clouds will part and the sun will come out, all this bullshit. And, and um, then one day I had the idea, I'll write the song about not being able to write the song. And Keep Hope Alive was written. And it's the only song, as far as I know, that is Words and Music by David Apolito and Sid Bernstein. <laughs> it's, it's very cool. It's quite poignant we've, we've completed this loop. Right? Well, what I, a loop. And I actually see there is now an audience behind us uh, on, on the hill, isn't there? I, I mean, hate these guys. <laughs> I hate these guys. Sorry to any animal lovers. There's a reason that I detest these guys and they hate me. It's because this used to be like I said, the jewel in the crown. This was, just picture this with golf course grass. It was lush, soft grass. And then they showed up. Oh. And uh, yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, we came one week um, and this was decimated. It was like all the grass was gone. In, in about a week or two weeks, they had, it, that became all dirt. Yeah, you. <laughs> So, I, have a, um, I have a friend, they, they, he got a shirt actually called the Goose Whisperer because <laughs> when I'm playing, they would come over and they'd start to come up and he'd be like, and they'd turn around and go the other way. Hey, so you guys. You, you don't play here anymore? No, I, well, uh, that, is that, is that I, the case? Or? I would play from May until October. Yeah. And then no matter what the weather was, I would have to stop because I've got the big concert in the first week or two of December. Yeah, and I was I always thought, you know, if I pl if the weather was beautiful and I played through November, why would somebody pay thirty five dollars for a ticket when they said, didn't we see him last week for a dollar? Oh yeah, good luck. So yeah. we stopped playing in uh, October. This year, again, see, people would have said, oh what bad luck. I think it's perfect. It rained the last four weekends. Yeah. So. I picked, a, I picked a good day to come here, didn't I? Yeah, really? so yes, I had absolutely, so I'm, again, I watched my bank account go like this and that, like this, and now I'm down at sea level again. But I think the timing is perfect because one of these plays is gonna hit. Yeah. And I'll just be laughing. Um, it's always been that way. It's always been that way. If I know it, if it looks like bad luck, it probably isn't. No, I shouldn't say that. Um, it's, so it looks like we had a few gremlins with the camera. Um, we, we're blaming these geese here, aren't yes, we? Yes, it's the we geese. Um, but David, this has been amazing. Uh, I'm glad. I, I, this is a beautiful place. You're a beautiful person. Well, thanks. And, it, don't, and I, I don't think I've uncovered half of what needs uncovering. Don't let people, I talk too much. <laughs> so I was kind of a nightmare for him, probably. <laughs> But I do appreciate you giving up your time. It's fantastic. Dogs. I'd love to see what happens next. Like, if your prediction of your screenplay and your movie come true, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? So, yeah. Uh, and and I, well, you come back for opening night. Yes, I will. Absolutely. And we'll yeah. go backstage and we can do one of these from backstage yeah. on Broadway. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. And uh, I'll bring the sun like I did this time, eh? Yeah. Actually, last five or six, maybe seven weekends in a row, it's been raining in Central Park. You picked a good one. Yeah, I think this shirt might have brought the weather, don't that you think? That was it. Yeah. It's my style. Yeah, that's good. Peace. I will never, people know this about me, I will never buy 
Uh, what, what would you call an umbrella in the UK? Uh, umbre uh, uh, umbrella. Umbrella. Umbrella, yeah. Okay, yeah. umbrella. Yeah. Um, I'll never buy a black one. Ever. Because there's enough black and gray. Yeah, that's right? what I think about shirts. This, we need color. This city needs, needs more color. Needs more color. So good for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David, very All much. Right, man. Really Thanks. enjoyed this. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care.